arsenal. Today, though, we are delighted to have author John Cuevas and photographer Jason Taylor with us to discuss their new University Press of Mississippi book, Discovering Cat Island, Photographs and History. We are also pleased to have with us Secretary of State Delbert Hoseman, who was reelected to his third term in office in 2015. In his role as State Land Commissioner, Secretary Hoseman has worked to acquire and preserve land for public use for future generations. Since 2012, he has led the effort to secure more than 700 acres on Cat Island and re-nourish the island's east beach, all without the use of any state funds. Help me welcome Mississippi Secretary of State Delbert Hoseman. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today is a good day. Um, well, first of all, the legislature's not here. Y'all don't quote me on that. They, they vote on my budget. Um, but it's a really good day, and I'm going to give you a little bit of history that has to do with me and the state of Mississippi and you. And then I'm going to be pleased to introduce John here very briefly. Um, about 15 years ago, uh, this island was discovered in 1699, and the Quavises showed up shortly thereafter. One of their direct heirs is standing with you today that wrote these two books, and I, I, I was so excited to be have the opportunity to meet him today. I had him autograph one of mine. After the, the long history, which he'll get into you, uh, the history that begins with the state of Mississippi began about 15 years ago. At that time, George Body, who I had met on the coast, had a residence there and owned a good bit of the island. They had purchased it from the Quavises early in the 19th century, 18th century, 19th century. And so we, um, we, we became friends and he invited me out to his location. I went out and walked the island. Um, I, I had some history with this. I went to St. Stanislaus in the, at Bay St. Louis in the summer, so I had sailed a sailboat. They let me sail around by myself. And I thought I was Bienville or somebody and I sail out towards Cat Island and come back. I thought I was really discovered America or whatever. But I was, I was mis it was a mystical thing, Cat Island, to me. And when George invited me out, we fished the uh, Scottish Cove, and we, and we walked that land and walked that land, I thought. And at that time, I said, you know, this ought to be part of the state of Mississippi. This, this resource, alluvial island, and it ought to be part of the state of Mississippi. And so it, that fast forward to the British petroleum oil spill, a catastrophic event to the environment for Mississippi and for most of the Gulf Coast. So when that occurred, I got rejuvenated into looking at the island. BP cleaned up part of it, um, and at, during that period, Mr. Body sold part of the island to BP, British Petroleum. So I went back down there and with British Petroleum, a lady <clears throat> that ran their acquisition work, and Mr. Body and I walked the island that you're going to hear so much about today. We walked along the beach, and, and I said to British Petroleum, um, you know, we in Mississippi really need to own this island, respect your company in this catastrophic event and the work you're trying to do to cure it in the eventual settlement, but we really need to own the island. About uh, two years later, about eight to ten years ago now, um, I got word that a certain subsidiary of BP that was offset had five million dollars to spend somewhere between Texas and Florida. And this, they, are, they were in um, so, Japanese company uh, with a, run by an individual, less part of it was run by an individual attorney in Houston, Texas. So I called him and said, boy, if you've got five million to spend, I got the spot. Come on down. <clears throat> Took him out to Cat Island. They fell in love with it just as I did. Uh, the pristine beauty of it, the history of it, the World War II history of it, the uh, 1812, War of 1812 history of it, the whole, the whole thing. And, and, the, and its ability to survive and, and continue on as it was. So we raised, uh, we talked them into giving us the full $5 million is what we talked them into. And we found that the uh, state of Mississippi had Katrina funds that were going back and they had lapsed and went back on December the 31st. I found this out about November the 2nd or 3rd. So I was hustling really hard. And we bought from the bodies uh, with those funds and a very limited amount of state funds, I think three or four hundred thousand dollars, we bought the body part of it. So that turned us to uh, British Petroleum, who owned the remaining half. 
Her name is B. Stone. <clears throat> B and I were great friends. Um, about every two or three months, I would call British Petroleum. How are you doing, B? Fine, great, good to hear from you, Delbert. And uh, I said, are y'all ready to sell your island? No, no, we've really become in love with the island. We, we've decided British Petroleum wants to keep the island. I said, well, that's fine. I called back three months later, B, how are you doing? Fine, Delbert. I said, you know, the same scenario went on for a number of months. Oil at that time was $100, million, $100 per barrel. Y'all remember that. So all of a sudden it plummeted about three years ago. It plummeted to $40 a barrel. Hey, B, this is Delbert. Um, Y'all still want that island. I have been informed that we should uh, expunge all non-performing assets of British Petroleum. I said, that'd be great. <laughs> I'm here for non-performing assets. So she said, I said, how much? $13 million is what, is what it appraised for, and that's what our share, and that's 300 acres. We Y'all now own about seven to 800 acres of it. And I, she said, $13 million. I said, so, we'll buy it. I hung up the phone. The only problem with that, I didn't have any money. <laughs> so I was $13 million short of, of meeting the goals here. <clears throat> so I called the Corps of Engineers, and sure enough, um, a wonderful lady there that works there does a great job. She said, well, you know, we have some money left over from Katrina, and we have $13 million left over. Now, this is God's hand here. I'm just telling you, I'm not this good. We have $13 million. I have a place for it. It's BP. Well, we can't buy it uh, unless it's going to be given to the state. I said, I got a state. You know, this is, this is wonderful how this is working out. So, sure enough, um, we uh, used the funds that were left that the federal government had and were, were going to dissipate and go back. We used those funds to buy the remainder of the island. Then we looked at the fact that the island has been eroding. You know, when it was first found by the Quavises and everything, you could see this giant white sand beach, and that had eroded because sand in the, in the Gulf of Mexico was counterclockwise and we had dredged a 35-foot channel to Gulfport. Man's hand in just about everything will, has a, uh, some unintended consequences. So in talking with the Corps of Engineers, we really need to re-nourish the island. Yes, that would be great. So we did, and it was uh, $15 million to re-nourish 250 feet of sand, which will protect your island now that you own it, uh, really for generations for my grandchildren and children to come. So now you own it. And uh, when I when I was had the privilege of negotiating all of this and working on this over the years, uh, I became more and more enamored with the island. And when, when I bought it uh, for you, in my capacity as a state land commissioner, I put conservation easements on it that will require a unanimous consent of the population to make any change there. So it will be just as you see it today, as long as you don't get a vote of three million to zero. So, so with that, long before I had anything to do with this, and part of the, uh, the reason that spurred me uh, was John's book. Uh, I, re I read his Cat Island book and his histories and, and the what, and he's going to discuss that with you today. His, his work that he's done will preserve for history uh, what the Quavises did and all the things that go on. I want him to get more into that. It, is, it was an honor for me to write the foreword for this photography book. Jason is where is he? Right here. He'll be showing you the pictures in a minute, which are stunning in themselves. Uh, just bring back the, the vibrancy and the life of that, of that island. But even they don't do it justice, and I would encourage you uh, to go see your island every chance you get a chance. So without further ado, the guy that really started all of this and is responsible for its history and then the fact that we're all here today, if you'll come up, Jason, we're, we're very, we're so, John, we're so proud to have you here in Mississippi again. He's moved back here from Atlanta, smart man. We're glad to have you. Congratulations. Thank you. We'll see if this thing works. <laughs> Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, particularly for Secretary Holmesman, and um, we look forward to telling you a little bit about the island. My family 
First of all, I'll say that Cat Island is the most historic of the Barrier Islands, the most um, interesting and uh, exciting events took place there. And what this book is is uh, taking you step by step, showing you where these events took place, and uh, giving you a little history of it. Um, what what's unique about it? First of all, is one of the last privately owned of the Barrier Islands, and um, my family is unique in that it was the only family that ever called it home. Of all the owners since my family lived there, uh, it was either an investment or it was just a place to fish or do whatever. But I had three generations of my family actually grew there, had their children there. And uh, if, if, you, if you could send mail out at that time, they would send it to Cat Island. So that was... Uh, strictly home. So we'll go. There, there are so many things that happened out there that is really too much to uh, touch on today. So I'm going to just highlight a few of the things and, and show you what the book is all about. First, as uh, Secretary Hosman said, the French discovered Cat Island in uh, 1699. They were really looking for a deep water channel along the coast there. And the only place they could find was uh, at Ship Island. So that's where they really uh, set uh, their dock there. And um, it was an expedition trip uh, that they were going along the coast that they discovered Cat Island, which is right near there. Um, many people ask how did it get its name, but there was, at that time there were so many raccoons on the island. There's still quite a few, but not anything like it was before. And uh, these raccoons, to the French, look like big cats. And uh, so that's how the name actually came about. Uh, they called it Cat Island because of all the raccoons that came into their camp. Um, to, just to touch on a few of the things that's happened here, the first mutiny on American soil took place on Cat Island. There was an execution of an American who was a cousin of mine, uh, who was accused falsely and was uh, executed on the French wheel. I don't know if you what that is, but it, they strap you on like a wagon wheel and broke your bones with a sledgehammer. And that's the only American that has ever been killed that way. And then, of course, Jean Lafitte and the pirates, um, they used uh, Cat Island as a um, place to stock their booty until they could get it into New Orleans. Um, Al Capone was involved at Cat Island when he ran booze from Chicago, from the coast to Chicago. Um, and of course, the mighty British Navy, which was the most powerful at that time in the world, actually staged in front of Cat Island and between the Ship Island as they were getting ready to attack New Orleans in the Battle of New Orleans. Um, then probably the most uh, noteworthy, of course, is the uh, time during the Second World War when they actually trained dogs out there to uh, detect and um, fight the British, I mean the Japanese. In the book, you'll, you'll see a map like this, and, and this map points out the different historic sites. And each one of the numbers is, a, is one of the chapters. So it'd be like chapter one, chapter two, or whatever, and whatever that topic is. And you can go to the map and see where that location was. And then thanks to Jason's wonderful photography, we show you exactly what that site looks like today. So that if I had so many people ask me to take them out to the island and give them a tour. And of course, that's impossible for one person to take everybody out to the island. So I, I came up with this idea of doing like a guidebook to show people who have never been to Cat Island who may never get out there to kind of get an idea of what it's all about. And again, thanks to Jason, he was able to uh, uh, put that in pictures and I think he did an excellent job. Um, as I say, the Cuevas family was the first family of Cat Island. They, we um, got the, the uh, island through a Spanish land grant. At um, first, uh, the British owned it, and uh, 
my grand, my great grandfather's father in law applied for the uh, uh, land grant there with the British. The British didn't act on it fast enough, and Spain took over, and Spain was uh, honoring those land grants, so Spain uh, granted the island, and uh, we lived there again, like I say, for uh, three generations. One of the th ways that they supported themselves back then was raising cattle. Cattle was a big, big deal out there. Um, and interestingly, this Sabron, this picture shows you Sabron Ladner, and he actually kept the line of cattle going. So the cattle that are at Calpian Creek Farms here in Mississippi are actual descendants of the cattle that they raised out there in the uh, 17, 1800s. Um, this is a picture of the old Cuevas homestead. The um, people in the picture, I'm not sure of, I can't identify them. But this is the earliest photo of the, of the house. It stood for over 100 years, and I don't know how they built them in those days to, to uh, survive the hurricanes, but it did. It, it took um, some uh, campers who weren't real uh, careful <laughs> to burn it down. It seemed like... Uh, they, they didn't have any trouble at all burning it down, but anyway, imagine you wake up one morning and you look out your door and here in front of you is over 50 of the world's most powerful warships stopped right in your front door. And that's what the Cuevas family found in uh, 1814 as the um, British got ready to go into New Orleans. So they, they actually um, captured my grandfather, and I call him grandfather, even though he's great, 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 or whatever, but um, make it easier to talk about, actually captured him because they knew, at that time you didn't go into New Orleans up the Mississippi River because it was too treacherous to go up unless you were very familiar with it. And even the locals would get lost in there going up the Mississippi River, so they went in through um, the um, Bay of St. Louis and, and in that direction. And for that reason, they, they came right by the Cuevas house. Every ship that came into New Orleans went past the Cuevas house. And um, so they, their idea was that if they could get my grandfather to uh, show them the way to New Orleans, they could do a surprise attack on uh, General Jackson and without having to wander through all the swamps and all that kind of stuff. And um, he was not a citizen of the United States and he could have uh, easily have said yes or no or whatever. He had no obligation. He was a citizen of Spain. And, um, but the way they treated him and the way they treated his family, he said, no way. So what he did was um, he took them up the Pearl River, they, they had no idea of what the Mississippi was, but Pearl Rivers are pretty big also. And, and he got their big boats kind of stuck in the sand in the Pearl River. And uh, he was able to get away and he rode a boat. He got a boat from one of the Indian tribes that were friends. And uh, he, he was able to uh, row the boat to the Rigolets, which is an out, a watch, uh, watch post for the... Um, uh, General Jackson, and he was able to let them know that the British were about ready to attack. So that uh, was one of the big things that has happened on Cat Island. This shows this map shows you how the boats come in to um, uh, pass Cat Island into Lake Bourne and then into New Orleans, and that's how all the boats traveled. This is the first and the second. There were two lighthouses on Cat Island. My uh, great uncle, uh, my grandfather's son, was a lighthouse keeper. He was the second lighthouse keeper. The first lighthouse keeper was a, na a man named George Riley. And um, he died about a, an hour, a year into it uh, from yellow fever. And interestingly enough, then, when my um, uncle took over, he also took over George Riley's wife. Uh, they they got together and and got married after, uh, so he became the second lighthouse keeper, and then he married the first lighthouse keeper's wife, and then um, 
The uh, government didn't do a very good job. The guy was in charge of the uh, lighthouses at that time, had no interest in it at all. So the, all he was interested in was the bottom line. So what they did was uh, they built these cheaply. They, they didn't even build a foundation. They had that lighthouse built directly on the sand. So over a period of time, around by the Civil War, it, it uh, was gone completely. They had to tear it down. So eventually, though, they came back and built the second one, uh, which was a little more substantial. But uh, my, my grandfather died in uh, 1849. He was 87 years old. They buried him on Cat Island until they were able to build his tomb over in the Bluxy Cemetery, the old Bluxy Cemetery. And um, then his wife died in 1853. And the reason why I point this out is very interesting. Both of them are buried in that tomb. And um, the um, way they did that is they let the whoever died first <laughs> was interred in the tomb. And then after a year, they waited exactly a year because they, they determined that that's how long it took for the body to deteriorate. And then when the other person died, even if they had to store them someplace first or bury them someplace else, they would rake the bones into what was called a caveau, which is, I've got a picture of it right there. They would rake those bones to the back and then they'd show. So sometimes they would have six and seven or eight people buried in that same tomb by just pushing the bones back. Um, getting on to Jean Lafitte, he <coughs> supposedly, he, uh, he owned a house over in Waveland. And I, I was fortunate enough to tour that house before it was destroyed in 1969 with Camille. But the rumors were that he had held slaves there and um, he was in the slave trade also and that there was a tunnel under the ground, under the house there that came out to the Gulf and that's how they would transport those slaves. And when I went through the house, there was actually, I was shown, the owner showed me, down in the basement, there was this place where you could actually see where the shackles were uh, attached to the wall. And it was just, you could just feel the history in the house. And I'm so sorry that, it, that Camille took that down. But um, this is an interesting picture of the foyer of the Jean Lafitte home. And you can actually see like a treasure chest there in the corner, as you would expect a pirate to have. Um, also, we had an interesting uh, thing with the Seminole Indians. Back in uh, 1834, uh, the, um, and I think the next slide might tell that, yeah, the Creek Indians, which was a federation really, there, there was a tribe called Creek, but there was also a federation of uh, four of the Indian tribes. There was the Chickasaw, Choctaw, Cherokee, and the Creeks. And the Seminoles were also part of this uh, federation because they all spoke a common language, it was Muscogean. And um, the uh, Creeks began migrating down into northern Florida, and in that uh, area they became known as the Seminoles. And um, in 1830, President Jackson signed the uh, Indian Removal Act where they were forcing all the Indians into reservations. Was This, as you know, is a, a tremendous uh, thing for the Indians. They, they made them walk miles uh, for days over land to get to these reservations. And um, some guy in Alabama came up with the idea of instead of making them walk, float them down the, the um, river and get to the ocean. They get them over to New Orleans and they could take them up the Mississippi River. So um, that's what they did. But what they did, they needed to have a stopping point and they used Cat Island. They arranged with my family to allow the Indians to stay there on the island uh, as a rest stop of, before going on to New Orleans and making the trek up to the reservations in Oklahoma and, and up in that direction. So the, um, had the Seminoles camped there about a mile from the family home. Um, and I, again, there are a lot of things that happened. As you could tell from that map, there were a lot of things. So I'm just going to touch on a few of them. One of the bigger things here is uh, 
Senator Hernando de Soto Money, who um, bought the island in 1863 because he, he got the idea that this would make a great resort, and, it, and that's been tried several times. But anyway, he was going to liken it to the Santa um, Catalina Island off of California. Well, that didn't uh, turn out so well. So what he did, he began re raising Belgian hares there. At that time, Belgian hares had gotten real popular, and these hares would go for as much as $600 a rabbit. And uh, so he saw this as a great breeding ground for these rabbits. So unfortunately, that didn't work because it turns out that Belgian hares require a lot of personal attention to breed. And when you're just on a big island by yourself, it just didn't, they didn't breed like they were supposed to. So he, he lost a ton of money there. And then, um, the next, another big thing was the Goose Point uh, Tarpon Club. Uh, uh, several businessmen would go out every weekend or whenever and, and go deep sea fishing out there and all. And um, Bidwell Adams, who used to be the Lieutenant Governor of Mississippi for a period of time, uh, came up with the idea of why not let's do a private uh, fishing club out there and that way we'll have a place to come out and stay. And so they did and they built this two-story club and um, they made it a private membership and um, they got their friends and all to chip in and um, it turns out it's, it was the largest structure that's ever been built on a, one of the barrier islands. Again, unfortunately, it burned down when um, the cook who they, they had, they had a full-time cook there and um, when he was away, he would go to the mainland to get supplies and while he was gone one time, there was a fire star. They kept their firewood and all underneath and something sparked the wood and by the time he got back it, it had all burned down and the men decided at that time because it was during the depression at that point that it wasn't worth building back so they didn't build it back now we were talking about earlier the the war dogs uh, that were uh, trained out there there was a Swiss army officer named uh, William Pestry and um, he made a, a wild proposal to President Roosevelt. And his theory was that you could detect the different ethnic groups by their smell, because of the food that they ate and different things, their food, you, they, their body would give off different smells. And he, he thought he could train dogs to identify particularly the Japanese. Now, during the war, Roosevelt was kind of, um, he was uh, desperate to find anything that would help. And so they went along with this crazy idea and they chose um, Cat Island because it, it has the vegetation and everything that was very similar to the South Pacific. And so it was, it, they were trying to represent exactly the, what the, uh, uh, the, whole, the dogs would have to experience. Then they, uh, they asked people to um, contribute their family pets to this. Uh, but the family pet, the people didn't know what they were really giving their dogs for. They just thought it was to help the war effort. And they were actually sending them out to Cat Island here and for this guy to train. And they got American Japanese uh, people to volunteer in this and they they would try to train these dogs to chase these japanese americans and everything it turned out this is crazy it didn't work at all and so when the, the dogs would actually catch the, the japanese guy and they would lick them to death you know and, and they even tried uh, tying meat around their throat for the dogs to go for their throat and again they would just eat the meat and lick the guys and so when the generals came out there to assess the situation they said well it's nothing more than a circus act we're not going to go for this so they abandoned everything but you can actually see out there today and jason has some good pictures of what the kennels what's remaining of the kennels out there uh, but you can see in this they were just they were they were like 250 dogs and they took only certain breeds and uh, they were you know obviously the the working dogs like uh, Doberman Pinschers and German Shepherds and that type thing. 
Then uh, <coughs> Governor Russell, on another time, again had this idea of making um, a big resort out there. And uh, so he envisioned even a causeway from the uh, coast all the way over to Cat Island, and he was going to, it was just going to be fantastic. Well, that didn't pan out either. But in the meantime, this guy Carl Fisher, and y'all may not know him, but he uh, made an offer of a million dollars to um, Governor Russell to buy this island, and um, Russell turned him down. Well, Carl Fisher left Cat Island and went and started Miami Beach. So he's the developer of Miami Beach. And you wonder what Cat Island and the Gulf Coast would have looked like if they'd allowed Carl Fisher to take over. <laughs> so Russell screwed up there and he lost his shirt on it too. Uh, a little more recently, uh, it, it was uh, designated as a satellite launch site. Uh, one of the seven original astronauts, Deke Slayton, after he retired from NASA, he went to work for this private uh, company called Space Services, and they, they were sending, they were going to send up their own rockets, mainly for agricultural purposes, to see, to try to help the um, farmers and everything. I don't know how that works, but anyway, they had chosen uh, Cat Island as the uh, launch site because it apparently was right in the right position to most easily get into space or whatever it was. But um, that fizzled out too when uh, their money ran out. They, I think they had a couple uh, uh, rockets that exploded and one didn't go up and so that whole business went out. <laughs> um, then as we know, the National Park Service came along and um, they, they had tried to um, you put the island in the Gulf Islands National Seashore when the seashore was first started. Cat Island has always been considered the jewel of the National Seashore, but uh, Mr. Body, who owned it at that time, uh, did not want to give up his private island to the government, so uh, he, he said no, but the government was close to taking it over from by eminent domain, and so Body did something that was uh, kind of different. He, he had a channel dug into the island, and that channel is there now. It's a canal that goes into the middle of the island, and he sold lots to about 14 of his friends. And uh, that was to show the government that it was under, he was getting ready to develop the island, and therefore that kind of took it off the table for being part of the Gulf Islands National Seashore. And that, that remained that way until about 2002 when the National Park Service uh, again negotiated with uh, George Vidi and uh, was able to buy at that time about a half of it. The per the uh, What happened was the uh, casinos that had gotten big at that point had begun to come to the bodies and uh, they were interested in that for more amenities for their casino and um, take the people out for fishing or whatever. And I, I had to hand it to the bodies they were uh, resistant to commercial development. The, the island has been in a pristine condition all these years with no real development out there. And um, so they decided it was better to sell it to the uh, uh, government. So what they did was they agreed for the government to take the, uh, for it to become part of the Gulf Islands National Seashore. But they only, the government could only fund half of it at that time. So the, the idea was when the funds became available, they would come back and buy the second half. And as red tape and the government works, it dragged on and the bodies withdrew that uh, proposal. And then when the um, BP oil spill happened, BP bought their, uh, that little part that they had because they felt like that they could... Uh, clean up the mess easier if they owned it rather than dealing with the owners of the island having to deal with uh, them being out there and everything. So they bought their little section, as the secretary just said. Um, then <coughs> finally the secretary of the state of Mississippi purchased half of the, or rather the other half, with the exception of the private land that the people still own. They still own that 
a few lots out there and the bodies retained a certain amount. And um, after the state bought everything but the BP, then eventually BP allowed them to buy the rest of it. So therefore now we have mostly half of it by the National Park Service and a half of it by everybody in the room. So um, the, the island is for everybody at this point. And as, as someone who is really connected to it like I have been all my life, really, um, it, it makes me really happy that the state has taken it over and that it will always remain the way it has been. Now, when I started this project, this book, I needed to find someone who could put the book in pictures, and I found the perfect person, and it's Jason Taylor here. He had already been doing photography on the islands and had done a brilliant job, and when I contacted him and made the proposal to him, he, he readily agreed, thanks to me. I appreciated it, and he, he worked diligently and gave us some great pictures. And I'm going to turn this over now to Jason, and he's going to explain to you all the difficulties and challenges it is to go out there and take pictures of an island. And so, Jason, if you want to come up and uh, say a few words. And Definitely. Then at the end, we're going to ask, answer some questions for you. Thank you. Well, I'm glad he covered the history because I couldn't touch any of that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I started, I took up photography in high school, just in film cameras, and back in the days when you actually had to learn what to do to get a good picture or you'd waste a roll of film. Um, and then, you know, back in, when digital photography came around, I got back into it and just started shooting pictures and you know, coastal sceneries and stuff like that. Um, but my main love has always been the Barrier Islands. So I've been out there my whole life. I go on my own, I take my own boat or I go on camping trips and just, I just always love photography, just doing photography out there. But I started sharing my photography on Facebook when Facebook came around. And um, you'll see that picture of the canoe is kind of the one that kicked it off for me. And I just, it just started growing and growing and growing. And before you knew it, I had gallery shows and art exhibits. And one day, I met, I met John at the Peter Anderson Festival in a book signing on his first book. And a few weeks later, you know, he called me and he said, would you like to do a book on Cat Island with me? And I said, of course. <laughs> I mean, it's not often that, you know, for an artist to be able to put your, combine your art with your passion into something that's you know meaningful like this. So and it was so it was no hesitation at all. Um, you'll see a picture of me there. That's pretty much you know how to get the photographs on the island. You essentially just spend as much time as you can out there. And camping is the, really the way to do it. You know you got to be there at the early morning light and the evening light. Um, so camping is the best way to do it. But the challenge with Cat Island. And I've spent a lot of time on Petty Boy, Horn, Ship. Cat's kind of different. It's, it's bigger, it's deeper. Um, the conditions are a lot more harsh. Uh, it's about 10 miles offshore, but when you're in the middle of that island, you feel isolated. You, there's just something special about that island. You know, the other islands are beautiful, but Cat Island, there's something special. It's almost as if you can feel the history there. Um, so being 10 miles offshore, when you're camping on that island, you, you feel like you're hundreds of miles away from any civilization. Um, but the, the challenges of it, particularly Cat, particularly Cat Island, it's hard to get to, for one. You know, all the other barrier islands, you essentially can just pull up to them and jump off your boat and explore. Cat Island is very shallow, very far out. So if you don't know what you're doing, you're not really going to make it out to the island very easily. So that's one challenge. The other challenge is just getting out there. I mean, it, it can be rough. Ten miles between Cat Island and the, and the coast can be deadly, you know, if you don't paint the conditions right. Um, but the absolute worst part are the insects. And they can be, torture is probably the best way to describe it. 
And if you're camping on that island in the spring and it's getting kind of warm, you better be prepared or you're going to be <laughs> miserable. I mean, I've had times when I literally, I can remember one time in particular, I was up one morning taking some pictures and what I would do is, I mean, that's when it was, I think, well, Bob Marsh, he's sitting in the back. He shot that picture of me, <laughs> but that's in the summertime. But in the, normally I would be covered from head to toe, you know, would be covered. The only thing you would see on me would be my fingertips and my eyeballs. And I remember one morning on Cat Island, I got up to shoot some pictures and the gnats were so bad that I took a filter off my lens to replace it with another filter. And when I put the filter back on, it was covered with gnats. And I just had to quit. I just went back in my tent and, <laughs> and just waited it out. But it's a very difficult place to, to explore, particularly for the bugs. But really all I would do is just spend as much time as I could out there camping and just exploring the island. And I know the island really well. Um, let's see. So I'm, I've got a few pictures here from the book. I didn't put a whole lot of pictures in, but this area here um, would be in the area that, where the Goose Point Tarpon Club is. This would be along the eastern shore. Uh, and you can see it's, it's, a, it's the expanse of the island. It, it's a very large island. And that would be in the area where the Cuevas House is. That's the north point. That's the hardest part of the island to get to because it's so shallow. So the Cuevas house would be sitting just north of that beach. That's on the northern tip of the island in some of the dunes. Uh, going back to this other photo, the one with the shell, that, that's my favorite picture from the book. But that's, that's from the western tip of the island. That's why I put that one in there. Uh, That's also in the area of the Cuevas homestead, the northern portion of the island. Um, there are a lot of osprey nests on that island. All the barrier islands are covered with osprey nests, but and there's, uh, to my knowledge, there's one bald eagle nest on the island. There are some photos of it in the book. There may be more now. That was a few years ago, last time I saw it. But there's a bald eagle nest, but there's a lot of osprey nests on there. Uh, not really sure where that is, but that's the last slide we have there. Um, but that's really all I wanted to cover was just the difficulties of getting the pictures, the camping, and just getting out there as much as you can and just having a passion for the island. I mean, I just love the islands, all of them. Um, I've done a lot of work on Horn, mostly, uh, mostly Horn, but you know, when he contacted me about doing this on Cat, I was eager to get out there more. So. I really enjoyed getting out there and getting the photos, but um, I'd be glad to answer any questions y'all have about the island. I think we're going to do some questions and answers. I a question. Yeah. Sure. Oh. Yeah. 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 Well, I, the, the mosquitoes can get bad out there. I don't know if that's one of the reasons or not, but yeah. I, and we were just discussing this too. I think that when my family lived out there, certainly the bugs couldn't be as bad as they are now because it would be difficult. And either that or they had a secret of dealing with them that we don't know about. But. Um, yeah, I, they're, they're bad out there right now. And interestingly enough, it, uh, it's worse on Cat Island than it is on the other barrier islands. And we don't know maybe the marshes that are out there, I'm not sure. But uh, bugs are a problem. Yeah, they seem to be, I found them worse. Than, I found the gnat, gnats to be the worst part. Mosquitoes, to me, are easier to deal with. You can generally cover up and use the mosquito spray. Mosquito spray in the deep will take care of the mosquitoes and the flies mostly. The gnats are difficult to deal with. The gnats are way worse than the mosquitoes. But the mosquitoes, I've, I've seen them pretty bad on Horn and, and Ship Island as well, but yeah, they're, they're pretty bad on Cat. I've never, 
I've always wondered how those people made it on that island. I, I don't understand how they did it. I don't know what they did. We were, that's like he said, we were talking about that on the way up here. I'm not sure what they did, if they stayed fully clothed all the time or if they had some kind of special way of dealing with it, but I can only imagine, I mean, having cows and in the heat of the summer, having to work those things all day long. I don't know how they, I guess when you do something, you just get used to it. Any other questions? Pardon me? Uh, do you, uh, Secretary, you, do you know about what the acreage is? It changes a little bit. It does. Uh, we own uh, about almost 800 acres, and the feds own about the same amount, maybe a little bit less. The bodies still retain about 70. So the overall pile uh, amount would be uh, over a thousand, it's over a thousand. And it, it has varied. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> you brought it up. And <laughs> It, um, the island is the same height as it always was. It sunk around it to make the Mississippi Sound. So it's shallow all the way up because that island was deposited there by a river. And also, some of the studies and the work that they've done in digging down into it, you'll find cypress trees out there, ancient, that are, are thousands of years old, that, that were there when that site was part of the mainland. And it's only that the mainland portion between the 10, 7 to 10 miles from there to uh, past Christiane and Bay St. Louis has sunk. Not, not the island. The island is the remains of what was highest. So it's real interesting. It's, it's, uh, having an alluvial island is very difficult, very different. So that's why it's also not getting renourished as, as these other islands are. So it's um, the fact that we protected it with a 250 feet a barrier means that it'll stay. Eventually, it, it probably would have uh, would have gone away. Well, there, very, uh, very range, very strange. The um, one of the reasons it's a T-shaped island. It's not a long like most of them are, but it's actually built up of two types of islands. <coughs> there, there's a bar type, which most of the islands are, which is what he described, which was made by the action of the waves and everything is built up these sandbar type islands which are subject to erosion and eventually some can disappear as in the case of the Isle of Capri which was down there in the 30s. But um, Can Island is different in that it is two different types of islands. One is a ridge built island and the other part is a sand um, built. This ridge built which has been developed over time does not wash away. So that, that's the reason why Cat Island, of all of the islands, um, was uh, open for development because it was more stable than the other islands. So anyway, <coughs> yes, okay. Oh, uh, thank you. This was a very interesting presentation. Um, I would love to see the island. Are there tours that go there, or do you have to be? Uh, no, there's not. This will be the closest tour you'll get to it's it. The book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's not a lot of demand that I know of. I mean, people would like to go. There used to be a, like a, a pontoon boat that would take people out on the weekends, but he would take them around to the south beaches and dump them up, people off, and they'd play in the beach. There's not a lot of people that really want to get thrown into the woods and spend a few days out there. So, you know, if you, know, you could get, if you really wanted to do that, you could hire a local <laughs> charter fisherman. They would probably take you out and pick you up if you wanted to do that. If you had some camping experience and you know what you're doing, you know where you're going. But uh, mostly what you'll see around the island is just fishermen. You know, they, they are in the shallows fishing, but you don't see a lot of people on the island. Right. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. This question is mainly dealing with history. And um, I was just wondering, since you, um, the 
Alan was there during when you the, the, is there and the French were there, the Spanish were there, then the British were there, and then you have the 13 colonies, and, each, and in each of the 13 colonies, you have slavery and agriculture. In Cat Island, you also said that there was um, agricultural activities in the island. I'm just wondering if any kind of slavery existed on, the isle, on that island uh, 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 at the time when you had colonies where you had slavery. Was there any slavery in Cat Island? Okay, so let, me, activities? let me understand. You're asking if there's any slavery involved in Cat Island? Is that what you're asking? Basically, yes. During the time of. <coughs> yeah, interestingly when the enough. Were, when, when the colonies were in existence under yeah. the British. Well, interestingly enough, my grandfather did have some slaves, but he freed the slaves before the Emancipation Proclamation came. And we have a document where he uh, gave them the freedom. And the thing that's interesting about the document is that it actually gives the slaves names. Usually those documents didn't give the names. And um, so, uh, yeah, he actually freed the, he had three. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Given that at the last minute. <laughs> anyway, there there was an interesting um, program on this finding your roots. I don't know if you know that show or not, but um, one of my relatives was um, featured on that, and. Um, I provided those documents to the program. They were very interested in the uh, fact that uh, we had the uh, the uh, document showing that he had freed the slaves and had their names. Like I said, it's very unusual to have their names. So that's all I know about the slaves. <laughs> okay. I was just going to mention a. Uh, uh, over my career with the Department of Environmental Quality, I had occasion, uh, several meetings I'm, I can think back on about Cat Island, and uh, I think once with one of the Bodhi, or is it Bodhi or Body, Body children? Body. Uh, another time was a uh, retired general. It, this was along the time, just I think before the uh, casino uh, legislation came through for the uh, the dockside or riverboat casinos, but it was another proposal to build a causeway out to the island. Oh, yeah. And they were going to string the water and sewer along this 10 mile causeway. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think it depended a lot on some participation from the state. And the, I guess the in return, the public would have access to the to the beach right, out exactly. there. And uh, that that kind of went away. I guess it was much easier and uh, it less expensive once you started developing the casinos along the coastline. I guess my my favorite proposal was when there was a uh, one of the shipbuilders uh, was signed on to build the new landing craft in the upper end of Biloxi Bay, the hovercraft uh, type uh, vessels. And they came in to meet with me about when, they, as they completed each vessel, they wanted to take them down through Back Bay and around the front, and they were going to do t open water testing and then uh, run them up on the beach and over the dunes on Cat Island yeah. <laughs> to test out these, these uh, 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 vessels. And I, I asked, I said, well, uh, I guess you've talked with the body family and I got this blank look, and they, I, they, I don't think they realized that, I, I believe this is before the National Seashore had any of the property there, but uh, they thought it was part of the National Seashore chain. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so I'm, I, I would be curious, I'm not sure what ever happened to that, if they, where they ended up testing those uh, vessels, but yeah. I, I thought that was uh, quite interesting. Well, it's, it, like I say, I, I just touched on a few points here, but. There are so many things like that that occurred on the island um, that's in the book. And so I, I think you'll find that interesting. Um, 
did the Cuevas family keep journals and how are these exact sites determined as just maybe one or two? Okay, well, now, and did they keep journals and what was the rest of them? Did the members of the, the original Cuevas family and then those descendants keep journals? So we have records of things that went on like the insects problem and-, and Well, uh, no, that, just not really journals. Uh, they couldn't read <laughs> and uh, they spoke. <laughs> They spoke um, Spanish originally, but French was the main language over there, so you can imagine uh, how that went. So, um, fortunately, I have, I, my father was like in his 50s when I was born, so he was born in the 1800s, and, and his mother was still living too, so because of that, I, I kind of had my feet in the past, and I was able to, uh, get information from some of those older people that were still living. Uh, my grandmother, my actual grandmother's brother, knew all about the island, I, and she did too. I was able to uh, um, get a lot of information from her, them, and they also, um, they were old enough to know some of uh, the children that were raised out there. So I, I had a personal connection to that because of the fact that my father was so much older and I kind of like skipped a generation. So I was fortunate in terms of learning history and everything about it. But they, they couldn't keep journals and people I don't think really, you hate to understand this is rural. I mean, this, the coast was very rural at that time. And I don't think anybody was keeping journals at that point, you know. So they were lucky to, you know, make it from day to day, you know. But anyway, any other questions? Actually, we have almost made it to the top of the hour. I had one question I wanted to ask, though. It's a beautiful book. Would you tell us just a few words about the choice to go with the black and white photography? Well, that, <laughs> thanks to our publisher, really. Um, we started out um, with the color, and, and we determined that it might be better to do it in black and white. And the more we, Jason and I, thought about it, you see so many of these uh, books and call the beautiful sunsets and uh, whatever, and pretty soon they all kind of look alike, really, you, you know. So, so how many photos can you take of the sunset, you know? So the idea of the black and white was really intriguing, and um, I was always a fan of black and white, and um, Jason agreed, and so we, we did the black and white, and I think it was a lot more dramatic than it would have been in color. So I think um, we made the right decisions on it, really. Yeah, it works out well for island photography because of the harsh lighting conditions you can use in black and white, you can use that to your favor with the contrast. Um, so you could actually use some shots. Normally you wouldn't be shooting in the middle of the day Whereas for black and white, a lot of times you can pull that off with the con to get the contrast out of it. Now you don't get your sunsets, the color in the sunsets and everything, but it still comes out pretty well. Um, but that's you know that's a good that was shot in the middle of the day from a kayak in one of the bayous, so you can see you get the contrast. It's it's really nice. Works out well. A lot of the shots work out well in black and white. Well, the book is beautiful. There are copies of it available for sale in the museum store just across the way here. Thank you all for coming today. Help me thank our speakers, and I hope we see you next thank week. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir.